Hello, you've reached. Please leave a message. We present the truth. We present the facts. Welcome to InfoSec Court, where the good, the bad, and the ugly are on trial. Here is our bailiff, Jay Harmon, and our press director, Nick Espinoza. Let's welcome tonight's guest judge, guest plaintiff, and guest defendant. Bailiff, please give us tonight's trial information. Well, welcome tonight's to tonight's case, uh, the IMSI catcher versus we the people. This is case number 22216-1A. Our plaintiff tonight is uh, Satiris Macrianis, and our defense is Caleb Pommels. Our judge tonight is Sondor Slattering. Everybody, please rise for our honorable judge. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. I'm filling in here for Alyssa Miller, who couldn't make it this evening. Um, so it's an honor to be here in her uh, in her place. Um, I'd like to go ahead and hear an opening statement from the plaintiff, if you would. Thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Your Honor. Uh, this is a, a complicated case around an exceptional product made by Harris Corporation that currently is defunct. Uh, I am a C SI catcher, could be abbreviated as well as uh, I'm a sinner, uh, but it's not. Uh, the acronym is used uh, as a unique identifier for, for our phones. Uh, to give an example, it's like the MAC address of our Ethernet ports in our PCs. In a similar ways, uh, phones uh, have a unique identifier be beyond the phone number. The reason is simple in this context. Uh, that criminals could change SIM cards uh, often, but uh, keep contacts and other data in the same phone. So the solution was, the solution was developed by Harris Corporation a long time ago uh, with multiple features such uh, as uh, denied of service for collection of data from phones and creating uh, fake cell phone tower stations that uh, 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 mobile phones can connect to it. Uh, this solution was sold to governments and agencies worldwide, uh, and but we don't know how helpful it was in capturing and sentencing uh, real criminals. Maybe the release of such uh, information uh, would have increased the public perception over the goodness of the solution, but now we are only left to, to assume. It is understandable that it's a human trait to assume uh, the worst, and in absence of any data uh, over the benefits, we only can see the negatives, that they are published around uh, the utilization of such product. Now, on the case, originally, to be absolutely frank with you, I was thinking of accusing them for overcharging uh, United States government for a product, uh, because here in Europe, uh, we could buy a GSM jammer for denial of service for as low as 102 euros. Uh, similarly, uh, Hack 5 uh, from United States and pineapple products uh, that I hope that they will sponsor uh, a future info court session, uh, could extract data from mobile phones over Wi-Fi easily and at affordable prices. Uh, nevertheless, um, then the second option that I had was to charge them for probably selling a device that is not uh, FCC approved. How it can be approved? Because uh, FCC rule states that any radio communication device should not interfere with the radio signals of other devices. Uh, but I'm very much sure that the product liability contracts have been drafted in such a way that all the blame goes back to uh, the, the government and the agency that purchased the equipment uh, if someone complains about it. So I bet that that's how is uh, life in the United States. So you need to have a very good lawyer. And I'm pretty sure that uh, they have uh, the very best engineers and the very best legal team to support them. So how do I build my case? So what is this case for? So imagine this, a local law enforcement unit uh, is utilizing uh, an IMCI catcher to target a high profile uh, cocaine dealer in, uh, in the ghettos. By doing so, they disrupt the normal operation of the local telecommunication provider by redirecting all the traffic uh, to the fake uh, cell phone station. At the same time, in the same neighborhood, 
a teenage a teenage skateboarder uh, breaks a leg or uh, an older fellow is stuck in the bathroom and needs to uh, an, an emergency assistance okay. can they place an emergency excuse me uh, the old commercial help i can't get up yeah i haven't seen that one uh probably it's a united states joke so yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. i'm sorry <laughs> yeah no <laughs> it's a good one so can they place an emergency call um we, we you know it's a very kind of like a serious question um what if um what if they didn't have a warrant at the same time that basically those two other events uh, were occurring? Uh, so as you can understand, we have some uh, ethical dilemmas here that needs to be discussed, uh, especially in cases of uh, uh, surveillance made uh, without a warrant. Uh, on the second, uh, second kind of like example that I could give, is imagine that you have a, a protest and uh, a law a law enforcement agency uh, targets the radicals within the, the protest. Uh, is the indi indiscriminate collection of data from all the participants in that pro protest uh, kind of like a, a fair use policy? Because uh, you know they could easily start collecting uh, uh, you know your our sexting and other Tinder related materials. So I personally, I would have been very embarrassed uh, if um, a law enforcement agency will read, uh, you know, my silly love letters or uh, sexting text messages uh, because just because they wanted to capture some key uh, keyboard gangsters, uh, they will be able to uh, read my own personal kind of like uh, uh, data. And in a case of uh, unwarranted legal interception, who can ensure me that if they find my text messages funnily enough that they you know they don't pass the joke down down to to mass media and uh, you know kind of like a uh, giving the case uh, uh, you know to 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 uh, local kind of like a tv broadcasters or other media that uh, you know they might utilize uh, uh, that information so in essence we have very much uh, an issue with uh, uh, with the legal interception done without a warrant, and uh, here I rest my case, and uh, that's from me. Uh, Plenty, if you brought up some really excellent points, um, it, you know, you you mentioned Hack Five and Pineapple, but um, I know I've tinkered around with things and, and other people have too, is uh, you can get a, a fairly used laptop for about $10, $15. You can buy a uh, USB wireless dongle um, that you can put into monitor mode for about $20 from, you know, folks like Amazon. Um, and sit in your local cafe and uh, utilizing a, a program called uh, Wi-Fi Pumpkin. Um, and you can capture any unencrypted uh, data that's floating through the air uh, via wireless, you know, Wi-Fi signal, um, not necessarily cellular signal. Um, so it's not it's not that difficult to do. Um, and I agree with you. It's 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 great to uh, um, have an understanding and awareness of, of what these are. Um, so anyway, let's now hear from the defense as our bailiff is uh, beating me up to do so. Hey, let's go ahead. And if, oh. uh, if I may, uh, Matt Lee kind of like I made a very good uh, comment on the that the Hack 5 does not stimulate sim cellular signal. Allegedly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yep, yeah. Absolutely. Let's let's give Caleb a moment here. And uh, what's your opening statement there, sir? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. And uh, may it please the court. Um, today I am representing Harris Corporation uh, in an unfair targeted malicious prosecution of my client, Harris Corporation. Uh, today, Harris Corporation stands accused of knowingly providing uh, equipment that law enforcement is using, uh, allegedly uh, contrary to uh, the Fourth Amendment. Um, this brings up a very interesting uh, you know, conversation. And, and I think that the, the plaintiff brought up an interesting point uh, earlier here you know, there are 
plenty of tools uh, that deal with radio wave uh, interceptions that are uh, readily available to the public. You can go on Amazon, as mentioned uh, by the judge and both the plaintiff, uh, and purchase uh, adapters that allow you to wirelessly intercept uh, radio communications. You can go online and, uh, you know, uh, as you mentioned, you can use tools like Wi-Fi Pumpkin. There are plenty of tools out there that allow you to intercept communications. And funny enough, uh, none of these other manufacturers or uh, software developers are ever the subject of such malicious uh, uh, targeting uh, by, the pro uh, by the plaintiff in this case. Uh, another thing that I want to quickly uh, jump in here to make sure that um, you know I clarify, the FCC provided Harris Corporation, my client, authorization to sell these devices. Uh, if you go, if you actually look back within FCC records, uh, the FCC provided explicit authorization uh, about roughly close to ten years ago. Uh, specifically authorizing the sale by Harris Corporation of these devices to uh, for commercial use to law enforcement agencies. This authorization extended the ability for Harris Corporation to sell to agencies like the FBI. Uh, this authorization allowed to sell to local law enforcement. Uh, as far as usage, once the device is sold, uh, you know, quite frankly, it is Congress's job, it is the job of the legislative branch to regulate uh, the, the, the state. And this extends all the way to the conduct of the FBI. It extends to the conduct of police departments across the nation. If law enforcement agencies are using our equipment improperly, uh, this isn't something that Harris Corporation is liable for. This is something that ultimately uh, these individual police departments should be held accountable for on those individual counts. So one of one of the things that I also really want to chat about here is that you know for just about twenty dollars you grab a software defined uh, radio and you can actually create your own IMEI catcher. Uh, ultimately, these are tools that are readily readily available to the public. Uh, can be used for both good and nefarious purposes. I want to take a moment to highlight the good here. Ultimately. Our devices have been used to locate missing, first, missing persons. They've been used uh, in the location of uh, those accused of uh, terrorism, both domestic and foreign terrorism. Uh, it's also uh, been used in the cases of uh, helping locate kidnapped uh, uh, children as well. Uh, so there are a number of use cases here that are ultimately our devices are being used for that the plaintiff, uh, you know, has coincidentally left out. Um, you know, so. What I really want to highlight here ultimately is that, uh, you know, the shift should be on Congress to ultimately make a decision here as far as oversight and what regulation they want to be applied to these devices. Because as far as I'm concerned, Harris Corporation explicitly received authorization from the FCC. We comply with all local uh, regulations as well as federal regulations that exist. Currently, right now, there's a bill uh, sitting in Congress uh, that uh, would specifically regulate the devices we sell. It has yet to been passed uh, through Congress. This is not on the fault of Harris Corporation. So I think that the plaintiffs should shift their attention to Congress and lobbying them to pass the regulations that they claim to want. But until that happens, Harris Corporation will continue to sell these devices and will do it because it's legal. And what happens after the fact is ultimately on the uh, law enforcement agencies who are subject uh, to those constitutional elements. Exactly my point, Your Honor, that uh, Harris Corporation has the best engineers and the best lawyers that they can find. Here's an example, Shalem. <laughs> um, no, excellent point there, uh, um, defendant. Um, so, you know, you bring up some, some really valid points. Both of you guys provided some phenomenal um, sides on there. And there's, 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 you know, uh, there's pros and cons. Um, why do we not go to Congress? Well, if we, you know, wanted a, a 45 minute to 60 minute trial session, um, this is where we would do it. Uh, but if we went to Congress, that might get dragged out to about six to 12 years. Um, but um, how long did it take for them to pass all the, the latest budgets? <laughs> anyway, um, 
So let me go ahead and set things up for the cross-examination here. And we'll go ahead and start with the plaintiff. Um, Satirius, if you could, you know, bring in some arguments and, and uh, um, let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's open it up to you there. Yeah, the, the technology is good and uh, we need surveillance and we need such tools in order to fight crime and uh, save human lives. The issue here uh, is about the unwarranted uh, surveillance that, of course, there are uh, some exceptions uh, in times of emergency, but uh, we need to see how many times uh, an unwarranted sur surveillance uh, occurred versus the severity and the criticality of, 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 of the issue. Uh, and uh, there, kind of like, uh, I believe that, uh, yes, we cannot compact uh, crime with, uh, you know, being inside the box. We need to think outside the box. Uh, but at least uh, we could apply some uh, four eyes uh, principles uh, in order to um, separate uh, the, the, the powers between those who have the machines and those who actually decide uh, to utilize the machines and 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 as uh, the best example that i could give is that separation of uh, state and church it took uh, 1000 years uh, here in europe and uh, here we have an example that uh, we give uh, uh, all the power into a law enforcement agency and somehow we need to separate that power uh, into two and have the courts issuing uh, valid warrants uh, for surveillance which subsequently uh, the law enforcement agencies should apply it to, 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 to conduct their jobs. And uh, well, that's a pressure. And, 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 um, and, and sorry to interject here. Um, there have been a few states, like three or four states uh, at least, that have implemented um, the requirement of a warrant to utilize these devices now. Um, there's some other states that, while they may not have it as a warrant requirement yet, um, they do have a notification requirement that uh, um, anytime these are used and, you know, in, in any kind of case um, during an investigation, um, they are required, you know, law enforcement agencies are required to present that information um, that it was, you know, utilized, that they did utilize an, an MZ catcher and, you know, which which company they bought it from and what make, model, all that kind of stuff. So, um, all right. And defendant, your turn now, sir. Absolutely. So, you know, I want to point back to a, a case that uh, the courts heard, uh, Smith v. Maryland. Uh, this was a case that established a lot of claims for Fourth Amendment uh, uh, violation uh, claims that came before the court. Uh, specifically, you know, one thing that I'll mention within Smith, it held that uh, the government's use of technology such as pen registers to record the numbers that people dialed on, dialed on their phone did not infringe on a reasonable expectation of privacy because this information is freely is already freely disclosed to other third parties. So this is where we come into the, the topic of the third party, uh, the third party uh, uh, distribution doctrine. So if this information is already shared with a third party, in this case, all of the cellular car carriers, AT&T, T-Mobile, and all of these other uh, carriers out there already have these this IMEI information as well. So when we look at uh, the case in Smith v. Maryland, uh, it's very clear that the courts have held that under that exception, uh, this information is, does not constitute an unreasonable, uh, you know, breach of privacy, or does, nor does it step into the Fourth Amendment. So, I, I think that you know, the, the the plaintiff made a lot of great points about you know wanting to increase warrant requirements. I think that the plaintiff, in reality, here what they should be doing, and as I mentioned before. Uh, the focus needs to be on these individual lawmakers who are tasked uh, with ultimately enforcing these requirements and establishing them. Harris Corporation, unfortunately, is not in the seat of the legislative branch. We can't pass legislation and we can't set requirements on warrants. Once we sell the hardware, because that is what it is, we, we're selling them hardware, how they choose to use that and whether or not there's any subsequent uh, violations of the Constitution, uh, really uh, focuses, I would say, uh, solely on the uh, as responsibility of the legislative branch. And we need to we need to see more of a push there. 
Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a better example. We, we can see, we can point towards, uh, you know, there are plenty of, uh, you know, objects and uh, goods out there that people use uh, improperly and manufacturers have generally been held to be exempt from th those types of uh, claims in court. Specifically, I'll point towards uh, the use of firearms. Uh, firearms are specifically, right, they are considered tools and how people use them uh, can sometimes run afoul of the law. In, in this uh, specific case, the law does not uh, provide um, any guidance here. So as technology develops and grows, right, we expect things like this to come up. And this is where the job of Congress and the the, each of the state's legislators really should be coming in here. So I think we need to shift more of the blame towards these individual departments rather than us as the manufacturer. And your honor, may, um, may I use a counter argument? Go ahead, go ahead, yes. Do you have an objection? Go ahead there. I'm, I'm, I'm not for more government interference into, I'm kind of like a morph about uh, responsibility in the corporate world. And let's take the example of cars and seat belts. You wouldn't sell a car today without a seat belt because you need that seat belt in order to protect the, the driver. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not about the Congress to decide. It's about the car manufacturer that basically puts safety mechanisms inside the car in order to make sure that the product is used properly and the driver is uh, uh, safe. So let's not blame the government for because we don't want we don't want micromanagement from the government. We want uh, the corporations, the product managers, the people in the industry to take responsibility to understand the real kind of like a corner cases and actually make a product that basically serves us better. Okay. The, those safety, and I'm glad that you used that as an example. Those safety measures are mandated by federal agencies as well as uh, under state law. So this, the manufacturers aren't doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it because they're required to by law. We're required to put seat belts in, in, in these cars. We're, we're required to also uh, implement any other sort of safety technology that Congress or the state legislators require us to uh, to implement. It's the same thing for IMEI catchers, right? In those three to five states that have imposed regulations on the on both the sale as well as the use of IMEI catchers, in those states, those uh, agencies who purchase from Harris Corporation are required to abide by those laws. In the states that don't have them, there simply is no uh, no, no no precedence, nor is there any law that they're running afoul of by doing this. At least that's what the Supreme Court says. Uh, you're, uh, I must admit that the defense is very good, but uh, the argument there, because we have a limited time, is like uh, uh, when you do a safety test on cars with an end cup kind of like a scoring, it's in the best interest of the corporation to score high. So it's not everything regulated by the government. So the extra safety mechanisms that the car manufacturers will put, they will put it in order to protect their brand image and uh, the perception that the public has for them. So in that sense, we understand your basic argument. You are very correct in the baseline, but we need to expand the thinking into uh, the, 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 the wider uh, context. Thank you very much. Something that uh, I can interject here with you both um, is- no, He's very good. You know, I like him. He's in debating mode. He is, he is. He's, 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 he's on top of it. Um, Absolutely. Have you had a chance, Caleb, to look at uh, even understand a little bit of some of the NDAs that Harris Corporation requires um, law enforcement to uh, sign? Unfortunately, I cannot confirm nor deny the existence of those NDAs. Nice. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> I will not drop them onto this table then. Um, do you, either one of you have any uh, final arguments before we go to closing statements? For sure. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and close up because I think I've already made my case. Ultimately, I think what we've seen here is that uh, the plaintiff uh, has not established uh, the subject uh, uh, very clearly of their claim. I think that they have some confusion around uh, who they should be bringing action against uh, here. Uh, and I don't believe Harris Corporation is the right party to be uh, attacking specifically. 
Um, I'll say that based off of the evidence that we've received today, the plaintiff has not substantiated claims of Fourth Amendment violations, uh, it's specifically as it pertains to Harris Corporation. As Harris Corporation does not personally perform the surveillance, law enforcement performs the surveillance. So ultimately, any claims of Fourth Amendment violations should be directed towards uh, the agencies who are, who are committing those violations. Uh, it's our contention here that uh, Harris Corporation has abided by all federal uh, and state regulations as they exist presently. Uh, and ultimately, again, if the plaintiff's argument is that they want to change those regulations, uh, then you know, by all means, lobby Congress, lobby your state legislator and get it done. But until it happens, uh, in this particular action, uh, the defense, the, the plaintiff has not established the basis of their claim uh, and the 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 argument that they've made does not apply to Harris Corporation. It applies to the users of the product. Thank you. I rest my case. Thank you, Caleb. And I greatly appreciate your time here. And let's go ahead and hear from the plaintiffs. So, Tius, let's go ahead and hear your closing statement, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I believe in the that uh, a corporation should uh, make the best effort to create and cover all the corner cases. And if there are reported cases uh, of unlawful, kind of like uh, unwarranted uh, legal interception or un un unwarranted interception of communication, uh, then uh, those use cases should be uh, uh, covered by the product development teams and cut the corners in order to make sure that the uh, previous legal cases uh, that they have brought these issues up are covered very well. And uh, during the last week, I read that even the Supreme Court Justice uh, Sotomayor uh, made a comment related to this unwarranted um, uh, interception of uh, interception of data. And I think that if the Supreme Court of the United States uh, discloses information that something is there needs to be uh, done, we shouldn't blame only the Congress. All the parties involved should share their responsibility and try to figure out the best possible way out. So it's not um, uh, pointing the finger into one direction, but all of us collectively, holistically, we need to see this and how we can fine tune it so we can kind of like minimize the unwanted results of something that actually is very good to have and we desperately need uh, corporations like Harris to uh, implement such technology so they can keep the rest of the population safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, plaintiffs. Satirius. Um, both you gentlemen did an excellent job today. Um, I have a tough decision to make. Um, there's a lot of information for me to process. So I'm going to go ahead and deliberate uh, um, for a brief recess here, um, and I'll be right back. Ask yourself, Ask yourself these three, three questions. questions. What, what assets do I use, use to run the mission critical, critical aspects, aspects of my business? business. What, what are the relevant threats, threats, threats to my assets? assets? And finally, and what, what capacity does my organization, organization have to detect the exploitation, the exploitation of one or more, more mission critical, critical assets? assets? Come, Come see your policy partners at BorderHawk.com. The world is moving faster than ever before. Securing transactions, identities, and data has never been more important. What this more connected and complex world needs is trust. When governments want to issue secure ID cards, they trust us. When technology companies want to provide peace of mind to their customers, they trust us. And on that note, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and offer uh, an interesting verdict. There's a lot of information on both sides um, that are both right and wrong. Um, well, not wrong from the parties, but in regards to how these are being used, um, I see a lot of good that's been done with them. Um, and I also see a lot of potential for some bad things that have happened um, because of these, uh, these devices. 
um, in the end, you know, we do need to have some some better laws, checks and balances in regards to the use of these uh, uh, IMEI, IMSI catchers. Um, and and I, I think uh, the plaintiff brought up some really good good points on that. Um, but also on the defense side, um, you know, it definitely, um, you know, kind of fell in line with that same thing. I'm going to give about a 50-50 here on, on both sides um, here in regards to, you know, Harris Corporation definitely needs to clean up some things. They uh, created an NDA, not to mention their device or their names um, in any cases. Uh, any during the course of any investigation and to me that shows that they went in and and sold these devices intentionally um to bypass any kind of warrants because if it was part of a warrant then there'd be no issues with having these devices um these these cell phone you know cell tower simulators are a man in the middle um a, a tack um, structure and I don't care if um, Microsoft wants to call it an AITM or attack in the middle. It, it's you know, um, it, AITM, MITM. Um, they are catching information that was not intended for law enforcement um, and then utilizing it with what they wish. Um, you know, yes, the target may have been a a person of interest um, in a case. Um, and sometimes these devices, you know, had some really great outcomes. Um, but at what cost does that come at? You know, um, being able to have a denial of service um, attack at their fingertips uh, would prevent, um, you know, hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, from being able to call uh, 911 in case of an emergency. Um, you know, uh, we can think of some major disasters had that been you know, utilized during a disaster at that point in time, the cripple in, in communication that could bring alone. Um, while I'm sure they're robust enough to handle 5, 10, 20, 100 calls at a time, maybe. Um, but, you know, 500 to 1,000 calls at the exact same time, everyone dialing 911 or 411 or, um, you know, what, 988 for mental health now. Um, I don't believe that they have that. So I, I, I you know, um, I do think that we need to honestly reevaluate from a legal perspective and take a look at the laws in regards to requiring a warrant across all 50 states, um, whether that's the federal government pushing the state governments to do so, uh, like seatbelt laws and, and helmet laws, um, or it's done by the state uh, themselves or by the federal government themselves, rather. Um, in either case, uh, I, I see a, a good balance here. Um, I've learned a lot and I hope you all have learned a lot as well. So um, thank you for, for participating today. And yeah, stay tuned for uh, um, uh, the final verdict with Nick, actually. Thank you for attending tonight's InfoSec Court. Please stick around for the final verdict with Nick Espinosa. And, and what, what a great, great case this evening. evening. This, this, I think, is so multifaceted, given, given the, the nature of the situation with, with Stingrays uh, and, and the Harris, Harris Corporation. Corporation. But I think, I think this is a really important, important one. If you couldn't, couldn't tell, tell, I unfortunately, unfortunately had to pre-record this, this, even though I'm, I'm at home, home I'm a bit, a bit under the weather today. Uh, I was uh, planning on being with you guys, uh, but, you know, but here we are. Next week, I should be back, you know, on full strength. But due to illness, I was not able to make it today. I'll be going to be asleep by the time you guys are watching this. Not COVID for the record. So, with that, and before I dive in, I'd like to thank our guests for all of the hard work that they did uh, today. What you see is not everything that they've done with the research, the conversations, the studying of these problems. So thank you very much to our executive producer, Sanders Slidering, for putting all of this together. Our bailiff, Jay Harmon, our guest prosecutor, Sotiris Macrigianis, I believe I pronounced that correctly, our guest defense attorney, Caleb Pommels, and our guest judge, Alyssa Miller. Thank you so very much. And hopefully, if you are in the cybersecurity community, we will see you uh, participate in some way, shape, or form in the future. Now, with that, 
I think this is one of the most important cases that we are going to try here at InfoSec Court. We have created technology over the decades that, quite frankly, the United States government has not kept up with in terms of legal framework. We have a constitutional right to privacy, to not be tracked, to not have our information used against us without first going through the proper legal procedures and channels to obtain a warrant. And then, then they have the ability to search us in some way. Harris's Stingray technology is just one example of how we have not kept up. Now, another example to go off on a bit of a tangent here would be the geofence warrants, which are basically fishing expeditions. Assume for a moment a crime was committed in your neighborhood, the police can get a warrant, which is the right procedure, but they can request location data of all mobile phones in the area including yours. So if I'm just sitting on my couch watching Netflix and somebody gets murdered four houses down, they can basically go and say, okay, tell me everybody who was in the area, all the cell phones, all these kinds of things, even though I would never be a suspect, now I potentially am simply because I was home at the same time somebody was getting killed. Or they can also do this if you didn't know for your Google searches, you happen to search the same address as a murder victim, you can now basically become a suspect thanks to that as the police say, they go to Google with a warrant and say, hey, Google, show me everybody that Googled this address or whatever it is. If I happen to be one of 10 people that did it for an uh, innocuous reason, I now become a suspect or at least a person of interest. That's what we're talking about here. And my point is not to digress off of Harris. It's to underscore that Harris is thriving off of the loopholes in the legal framework that quite frankly, don't protect us from the technology we use daily which also tracks us too. We are literally walking around with mobile phones that are tracking and seeing everything that we do. We are giving this information over to Google and Facebook and the Verizons and AT&Ts and Sprints of the world as well. These devices are powerful. These stingrays are powerful. And I can see a benefit to law enforcement for using these, but this technology, when it's spoofing a cell tower, is catching everybody's phone when we're in the vicinity, meaning I am innocently driving by that you know, high school, for example, and now suddenly my phone is caught up in this, what ramifications does that have for me beyond, let's say, my cell phone going down or me not able to get out? So in that vein, it's not really different if, if you're looking at it from asking Google for everybody's specific search terms here. The flip side of this technology is that I think it can also harm others as well. And here's what I mean. Now, True story. Um, basically, last year, uh, this, the last school year, I should say, uh, my local high school basically had um, a student bring a gun to school, unfortunately. Now, fortunately, nobody was harmed, but the police obviously showed up in force. They locked down the area, and then they deployed a stingray to uh, basically kill cell phone reception in the area. The point of that obviously would be to stop, let's say, the shooter from calling or coordinating with another shooter or something like that, but none of the innocent students or teachers could phone out or coordinate. I heard from my neighbors, oh yeah, my son or daughter was in school. We were frantically trying to call them because word travels fast in small communities and, and nobody could get in. Nobody could call in. The students came home and said, our phones went dead. We have no idea why. You know, that is the beauty and power of Stingray uh, technology in an emergency situation. But imagine if you had a heart attack and you live next to that school. That's what I'm talking about here. That is, I think, one of the core things. And so in that vein, I blame US law for not keeping what is literally a constitutional right safe from the technology that we continue to innovate and develop. And so with that, let's talk about some of the basic security controls uh, at play here. And, and we are not talking about this on the Stingray side. It's how to protect your phone from being caught up in something like this. Now at its core, uh, and I'm sure this was mentioned uh, during the trial, a Stingray device is just an IMSI catcher that targets legacy 2G or GSM networks by mimicking cell towers that your phone connects to. That's just a, the nutshell version of this. And so some of the things that you can try and do are trying to disable uh, the 2G or GSM network on your device if you can. It's very easy to do on jailbroken devices, meaning devices where you've gotten around the security controls of Apple or Android, but I'm not recommending that procedure. That's a pretty tough thing to do uh, if you're not experienced with this. You can also use a VPN to obfuscate where you're going, meaning you've got that personal VPN that is connecting you. So when you're going to Facebook or your bank or whatever, all uh, anybody seeing across the internet is an encrypted line. They don't know where you're going, but, and this is a very important, but a VPN will not stop your phone from performing the automatic handshake with a Stingray device. It will basically just garble, as I mentioned, any online data that it picks up, making it unreadable to the person running the surveillance operation. Also, also, at this moment, according to my homework, my research, there is no IMSI catchers 
for 5G networks. So if you're in an area with true 5G and you can configure your phone to only use 5G networks, then you can avoid stingrays as they're not even broadcasting or looking out for 2G or GSM signals. They're looking for that 5G network. You could do that with 4G as well, but there are catches with this. Now, the caveat with some 5G networks is that they're not actually 5G. What they are is expanded 4G networks with uh, faster speeds advertises 5G. at and I'm looking at you for that one. But beware, because 4G uh, infrastructure can be spoofed through a device known as a hailstorm. So heads up on that. Very similar to a Stingray, obviously, just on the 4G band, not 2G. The bottom line here is that there are not many controls that you can put into place to stop your phone from connecting to a spoof cell phone tower. And so by virtue of that, let's kind of discuss improvements here because I think the improvement here is on the legal side of the house. We need a federal law requiring warrants to issue, uh, basically to, to have to be issued if the police want to use a stingray in our area. Now, the nice part about this, or I should say the interesting part about this is on June 17th of last year, 2021, U.S. Representatives Ted Lieu, uh, Democrat of California, Ron White, and he's a senator from Oregon, Democrat, uh, Senator Steve Daines, Republican of um Montana and also uh, Representative Tom McClintock, Republican of California, introduced legislation to defend America's rights by requiring the government to get a warrant to deploy sting, uh, cell, cell site simulators, stingrays and other devices, which obviously are used by the law enforcement agencies to track us and all of that. Now, this was a bipartisan bill known as the Cell Site Simulator Warrant Act, and it puts an end to overlapping, confusing policies at the federal, state and local levels by creating a clear legal standard standard for use of cell site simulators by any government agency. These are the kinds of laws that we need. And I have to say, just on a complete aside, um, and just as I do my daily videos and podcasts, I see Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat of Oregon, show up a ton when it comes to privacy. And Ron, baby, if you're listening to this, please come on my radio show. I've been asking your people uh, to get you on my show for like a year now. So there you go. Now, with that, that's what we have. I think the biggest issue is, uh, you know, that we've got is the legal framework here. And until we fix that, we are going to perpetually have issues with stingrays and whatever replaces stingray when somebody figures out how to do it for 5G networks. And I think that is a huge problem. But it starts with our rights being enshrined enshrined in good law. And so with that, thank you very much once again to our guest prosecutor, Sotiris Macrigianis. Again, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Our guest defense attorney, Caleb Pommels. Our guest judge, Alyssa Miller. Our executive producer, Sander Slidenrank. Jay Harmon, our bailiff from Border Hawk Security. And I'm Nick Espinoza. Please feel free to connect to any of us on LinkedIn or follow us on any social medias. Come say hi, come hang out. We love it. Now, on behalf of InfoSec Court, thank you for watching. And remember, we're not lawyers, but we do play them on internet TV. So as always, stay vigilant, stay informed, and please stay secure. Good night, everyone. The world is moving faster than ever before. Securing transactions, identities, and data has never, never been more important. What this more connected and complex world needs is trust. When governments want to issue secure ID cards, they trust us. When technology companies want to provide peace of mind to their customers, they trust us.